a topic which has been of enormous interest to those people my age since uh, since independence. The first speech that I remember being given at the college I went to, although I went to an institution you don't call a college, but that's another matter, the, uh, was by uh, Chester Bowles, who was then our ambassador to India. And uh, the, the year after that, we had as the get, uh, one of our guests uh, the Indian ambassador to the United States. And that was 1955, I think. And that would have been uh, Meta, I believe, was it? it was Meta. Yes, OK. And we, we met him at the Waldorf Historia Hotel, then had a nice ride up to, to school with him. So I remember that vividly. So in any case, and of course, the major theme then was democracy and, and, uh, and India. And since then, we've gone through a lot of uh, uh, different uh, periods with India. And certainly, the Cold War had its complexities. Uh, not all Americans were enthusiastic about you 2 avoiding entangling alliances. But, uh, and certainly today, um, India is at the, the very center of questions of interest to the United States. Uh, India is on its way to being one of the world's great powers. It'll soon be the most populous nation on Earth. And uh, certainly, it has a population of enormous, not only size, but, but quality. And uh, the questions of nuclear weapons are in the mind of most of us, and the tensions with Pakistan are important. And uh, one of our great partners, I believe, of necessity in our concerns with sub-state actions in the future will be with countries like India. But there are a lot of, a lot of aspects to our relationship, and the ambassador uh, will certainly deal with those which he thinks are the most relevant and the most important. Uh, the ambassador has had a distinguished career uh, in the foreign service of his country. He joined it in 1963. In, at his headquarters, he's been had various assignments, but a, a number of them, three, have been to the Economic uh, Affairs Department in the Ministry of Finance, where he's held the position of Under Secretary and Deputy Secretary and Joint Secretary. He uh, also, interestingly, was Secretary General of the uh, Indian Council for Cultural Relations, and also served as Dean of the Foreign Service Institute. His overseas representations of India have in, uh, included serving as uh, Deputy Chief of Mission in Afghanistan, uh, in Brussels, and to the United States. He uh, was first appointed an ambassador uh, to uh, the United Arab uh, Emirates, and then served as High Commissioner to Nigeria and uh, High Commissioner to Great Britain at a later date. He uh, achieved a very, very distinguished position of Foreign Secretary, and uh, of course, most recently and presently, uh, serves as the Indian Ambassador to the United States. It's my enormous pleasure to present to you uh, His Excellency Lalit Man Singh. Dr. Frank Bird, President of the Baltimore Council for Foreign Affairs, thank you very much for those very kind remarks. Mr. Carpenter, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Bird, thank you for your gracious words of welcome and for your kind remarks about me and my career. This is my first visit to Baltimore since I arrived in Washington almost a year ago. I assure you, it's a relief to get away from the Beltway. <laughs> that escape is made even more delightful by the opportunity to interact with this very distinguished audience. India has historical associations with Baltimore, which go back to more than 200 years. The first American flagship to enter an Indian port was the Chesapeake of Baltimore, which left the United States in 1786 and returned to port in 1789. It is therefore not surprising that Baltimore continues to be a major gateway to the burgeoning trade between India and the United States. An increasing number of immigrants from India have made Maryland their home and have contributed substantially to the political, economic, and social life of this vibrant state. Five months have passed since the terrible events of September 11th. 
The horror of that black day continues to haunt us. Its consequences still determine how we conduct our daily lives. The terrorist attacks against the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were not simply an attack on the United States. They were an assault on the world's civilized people. Democratic and multicultural societies, such as those of India and the United States, are particularly vulnerable to the threat of organized terrorism. The values that we cherish, democracy, tolerance, and the rule of law, are precisely those which the terrorists seek to destroy and replace with their own medieval and perverse ideology. The support the terrorists receive from states who harbor them makes our task of confronting and defeating terrorism even more challenging. They should not, however, be allowed to succeed. The challenge is to defeat them, even while preserving our values and defending our principles. The fact that the barbaric attack of September 11th were conceived and planned in India's neighborhood is no surprise to us. India has been a victim of terrorism for more than two decades. More than 60,000 innocent lives have been lost. It took the events of September 11th to dramatically bring to the world's attention the global reach of terrorism. A devastated Afghanistan is on the slow and painful road to recovery. The terrorists have re retreated, at least for the time being. For us in India, however, there has been no respite. The attacks against the Legislative Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir on October 1st, and against India's parliament, the very soul of our democracy, on December 13th, brought home to us the stark reality that we could not let our guard down. Even today, terrorists trained, equipped, and financed from across our borders continue to take a daily toll of innocent lives. It is clear to us that the deadly swamp of terrorism is far from being drained. On January 22nd, the American Cultural Center in India's eastern city of Kolkata, or as it was known earlier as Calcutta, was attacked by terrorists. They killed five policemen who were protecting the center. The man who openly claimed responsibility for carrying out that attack, Aftab Ansari, Elias Farhan Malik, was arrested by the United Arab Emirates as he was about to board a flight from Dubai to Pakistan and has been extradited to India. They saw the same Ansari who had earlier spent time in an Indian jail and had become acquainted with another notorious terrorist, Sheikh Omar Saeed. I don't know if that rings a bell. Both appear to specialize in the crime of kidnapping. Sheikh Omar is accused of masterminding the kidnapping in Pakistan of Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl. It was the same Sheikh Omar who had earlier transferred a part of the ransom money collected by Ansari in other kidnapping case to Mohammed Atta, the ringleader of the September 11 terrorist attack on the United States. And this brings the whole matter right to your doorstep. I have cited this example to illustrate how India and the United States are threatened by the same source of terrorism. Several of these responsible for the most heinous terrorist attacks in India, including the hijacking of an Indian Airlines plane in December 1999, continue to receive refuge and succor in Pakistan. The government of Pakistan has so far refused to hand over these criminals to us. Even before September 11, India and the United States have cooperated closely in the common effort to root out the menace of terrorism. A joint working group on counterterrorism was established in January 2000 and has held four meetings so far. The mechanism has enabled us to exchange intelligence information and coordinate our strategies to defeat the common enemy. During the recent visits of our Prime Minister and Home Minister, both countries have agreed on augmenting the level of cooperation, including the launch 
of a joint cyber terrorism initiative and the strengthening of the security of India's borders. India and the US are today partners in the global coalition against terrorism. This is only one element, however, of a robust relationship that includes a wide range of political, economic, cultural, scientific, and technological activities. My Prime Minister has repeatedly said that India and the United States are natural allies. India's constitution, adopted 52 years ago, reflected to a very substantial extent the ideas of Adams, Madison, and Hamilton. Although greatly separated in time and distance, our founding fathers shared a common vision. We both have diverse societies with a deeply entrenched commitment to pluralism, individual rights, and open debate. It is on the sturdy pillar of these common values that the edifice of our natural alliance has been built. When I was last assigned to the United States a decade ago, relations between our two countries were friendly, but not intense. We, are much, we were marching together, but not hand in hand. The situation today is vastly different. Three factors are principally responsible for this remarkable transformation in our relations. Firstly, as you rightly pointed out, the lifting of the clouds of the Cold War has helped focus our vision on our common objective to build a more peaceful and prosperous world. Second, India's economic reform program has greatly expanded opportunities for trade and investment between our countries. The US has identified India as one of the 10 largest emerging markets in the world. Perhaps most important is the community of Indian origin in the United States. This community has emerged as a valuable asset, investing the bilateral relationship, substantial political, economic, and technological value. In 1993, the caucus on India and Indian Americans in the House of Representatives had a membership of only eight. The caucus today boasts of a strength of more than 130 members. It is the largest single country caucus in the House of Representatives. During the 106th Congress, Prime Minister Vajpayee was the only foreign leader to be accorded the honor of an address to the joint session of the Congress. Even as we pursue the campaign against terrorism, India and the United States continue to build on the progress we have made in other areas. President Bush has said that his administration is committed to developing a fundamentally different relationship with India, one based on trust and mutual values. A wide-ranging institutional dialogue structure now provides the vehicle for a broadening and deepening of our bilateral relationship. Apart from political consultations at a variety of levels, the structure provides for a financial and economic forum, a commercial dialogue, a consultative group on energy and environment, a science and technology forum, and working groups on terrorism and US peacekeeping. We have engaged in a very productive dialogue over the last few months. Our external affairs minister was here in October, our prime minister in November, and ministers for home, defense, and finance in January. From the United States, the US TR, Ambassador Robert Selig, visited India in August, Secretary of State Powell in October and again in January, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld in November, and Deputy Treasury Secretary Kenneth Dam earlier this month. Prime Minister Vajpayee and President Bush agreed in November to intensify our bilateral interaction in several areas. We are both consulting on Afghanistan. Cooperation in the field of defense and counterterrorism has been expanded. The new strategic framework dialogue is to be established. The economic dialogue is being broadened and strengthened. There will be new stimulus to high technology commerce, civilian space cooperation, and civilian nuclear cooperation. The lifting of economic, military, and technology restrictions 
imposed in the wake of our nuclear tests four years ago have laid the groundwork for substantive progress in defense cooperation between the two countries. The defense policy group has been revived, and over the last three months, there have been intensive interactions, both between civilian officials and the armed forces. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Myers, is currently visiting India. Joint exercises are to be revived soon. We also have agreed to commence a dialogue towards evaluating the processes by which dual use and military items can be transferred to reflect the present realities of the relationship. There is today greater understanding of the security concerns which prompted India to conduct its nuclear tests in 1998. India has always believed that nuclear weapons are a threat to global security. They are not and must never become instruments of war. Their relevance lies in the capacity to deter as before, India remains committed to the elimination of all weapons of mass destruction globally. We would continue to strive for a world free of nuclear weapons and to press for universal, verifiable nuclear disarmament. At the same time, even, even as we maintain a minimum credible nuclear deterrent, we have proclaimed a policy of voluntary moratorium on all further explosive nuclear underground testing. We have declared a policy of no first use against nuclear weapon states and non-use against non-nuclear weapon states. Our policies are and shall continue to be marked by considerations of restraint and responsibility. Over the last decade, India's GDP has grown at an average annual rate of 6.5%. The Indian economy is reckoned today amongst the five fastest growing economies of the world. Despite a global economic slowdown, India's growth prospects are brighter than elsewhere. There is political stability and a firm commitment to carrying forward the process of economic reforms. Our objective is to double the per capita income over the next, next 10 years. The US is India's largest trading partner and largest foreign investor. Our bilateral trade in 2001 was about $18 billion, representing a 100% increase in the last six years. As the process of economic reform and privatization in India moves forward, the potential for a more rapid expansion of our trade will increase. The involvement of US companies in India today spans virtually every sector that is open to private investment. The revolution in information and communications technology holds out exciting pro prospects for India and the United States to jointly tackle the digital divide. We have complementarities of skill and resources. India's cost-effective and innovative software skills can be productively coupled with the strength of the US hardware industry. Our goal should be to develop entrepreneurial commercial strategies to help reach the new technologies to all sections of our society. India's foreign policy draws on principles that are a legacy from our freedom struggle. With our immediate neighbors, our policy has consistently been to develop our relations in an atmosphere of mutual trust and on the basis of mutually advantageous initiatives. The Chinese Prime Minister on a recent visit to India, acknowledged that China and India both have a responsibility for maintaining peace in Asia. India's relations with Russia, with the European Union, with Japan, with Southeast Asia, and the Gulf countries reflect the basic directions of our foreign policy based on peace, friendship, and convergence of interests. In the last two years, however, no relationship has progressed more rapidly than the one we have with the United States. Our two countries are consulting closely on matters consult concerning the United Nations. India has a clear view relating to the reform of the UN system, particularly the Security Council. Even as the United Nations seeks to promote democracy throughout the world, 
we call for it to set an example by democratizing its own structures and by making them more representative. We believe India is fully qualified to fulfill the responsibilities of permanent membership of the UN Security Council. As we survey the world a decade after the end of the Cold War, we see ourselves facing important challenges. The challenge of security, the challenge of economic development, and the challenge of technology. These have coalesced into an interconnected system which is called globalization. Pushed by remarkable changes in technology relating to the flow of information, globalization is essentially an effort at integration of markets and economies and a getting together of ideas. It is built around the shrinking of a digitalized globe. However, it also has important implications for the security of developing countries. Stronger Indo-US relations are an inescapable imperative for the future. We have many common interests, stabilizing the Asia-Pacific region, countering terrorism, religious extremism, and narcotics trafficking, dealing with the possibility of failures of states in the region, ensuring access to energy resources and reserves in Asia, maintaining freedom and security of sea lanes, in preventing and countering pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and delivery systems. And this has acquired a new meaning in view of the possibilities of the acquisition by terrorist groups. And finally, advancing economic stability and prosperity in these uncertain times. During his visit to the United States in 1949, India's fr first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, said that he had come, I quote, on a voyage of discovery of the mind and heart of America, and to place before you our own mind and heart, unquote. Five decades later, as we enter a new millennium, both India and the United States are confronted with a new world reality. Destiny has enjoined our people to strive together for the goals which our founding fathers dreamed of, a free and democratic world which would be humane, peaceful, and equitable. With our shared values and complementarities, we can together make a major impact everywhere. The road is long and difficult, but I'm confident that the force of our ideas and the righteousness of our convictions will prevail. I thank you very much for your patience. Well, we, we thank you for a marvelously clear and comprehensive presentation of the topic, U.S.-Indian relations. Yes, sir. The uh, question is, what is your position on transforming truce lines in Kashmir into permanent national boundaries? Let me explain the official position that we have. Uh, let me go back to 1947, when British India was partitioned into India and Pakistan. Uh, it was in accordance with the Independence of India Act, which was passed by the British Parliament. And one of the provisions there was that the future of the princely states with which the British had treaty relationship would be decided through an instrument of accession. Namely, it would be open to the prince or the ruler to sign an instrument of accession either in favor of India or in favor of Pakistan. Right. In the case of Jammu and Kashmir, the Maharaja, the prince, signed the instrument of accession in favor of India. So legally and constitutionally, the entire province of Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of India. Now, the reality is that Pakistan is in illegal occupation of one third of that province. Now, this is an idea which has cropped up saying, well, this is a possible solution, maintain the status quo and uh, let Pakistan have what it has, let India have what it has. Now, our government is not in favor of that because why should we give up what is ours? But um, who knows if, if uh, the two countries uh, negotiate with each other, who knows what the outcome and what kind of solution will take place. There, 
are two questions. One is, uh, would you comment on India's position with respect to a, a referendum uh, on Kashmir? And the second question is better if you repeat it, actually. It's about Doha, about the Doha conference on the WTO. I take that. All right, okay. Um, on, on the issue of referendum, um, let me take you back to what happened in 1947 and 48. Uh, there was an invasion of tribesmen from Pakistan. Actually, there were tribesmen and there were Pakistani regulars who came dressed in civilian clothes. But it was an actual invasion, and they were coming towards Srinagar, too. And it was India which approached the United Nations to say that aggression had been committed. Now, the UN asked for a ceasefire and said that, recommended, that once the ceasefire is in effect, then steps should be taken for the Pakistani troops to vacate the aggression, the Pakistani authorities to withdraw from Kashmir, and then hold a referendum to ascertain the wishes of the people. Now, we accepted that and that was 50 years ago. What was not done was the withdrawal of the Pakistani troops and the Pakistani authorities. So they stayed on, and they integrated that part of Jammu and Kashmir into Pakistan. Nominally, it's called Azad Kashmir, but actually it is a piece of territory administered from Islamabad. Our position has been that since the conditions for a plebiscite have not been met, it has not been possible to conduct a plebiscite in accordance with the UN resolution. However, let me point out that whereas the area under Pakistani control has never enjoyed democracy in the sense that we know it, because as you know, for most of its history, Pakistan has been under military rule. On our side of Kashmir, we've had elections. There has been a constituent assembly, and there is a Jammu and Kashmir assembly, and they enjoy democracy like the rest of India. And if you say that the wishes of the people has to be ascertained, we have a unanimous resolution of the Constituent Assembly and of the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly, which supported the integration of the state in India. So on plebiscite, our position remains that it has not been possible to carry it out because Pakistan didn't vacate that territory and didn't comply with the requirements of plebiscite. But so far as the wishes of the people are concerned, democracy has provided the answer. All right. Now, regarding the second question, the uh, ministerial conference which took place in Doha, and this was really concerning a new round of trade negotiations. On that, we found that we had fundamental differences with the uh, Western countries. And India represented the viewpoint of the developing countries. And we took the view that it is not right to start a new round of negotiations because we are still facing problems in the earlier round of negotiations. The goal of the earlier round was to free international trade and to enable all countries of the world to trade freely. Now, in the meantime, we found that certain barriers had been created to free trade, particularly in the industrial countries, by uh, restricting the access of a lot of products among the developing countries. Let me make special mention of textiles. Trade is supposed to be free, but we can't export textiles to either Europe or the United States because we are restricted by quotas. Same thing about uh, steel and a whole range of products where our cost of production is lower, but in order to protect domestic industry, the industrial countries are saying, we will have punitive uh, uh, anti-dumping duties or countervailing duties to stop these products from coming in. So we are saying, resolve these issues first before you embark on a new round. Secondly, we are disturbed by a growing demand in the Western countries for non-trade issues to come up, like labor standards, environment issues. We are maintaining that the WTO is a forum for discussing trade issues. If you want to discuss labor issues, you go to an organization like the International Labor Organization, which is meant for discussing labor issues. Or you want to discuss environment issues, there's a separate structure, there's been the Kyoto Protocol and discussions going on. So uh, I think we, are, uh, we were justified in saying that let us first 
resolve the issues which are, uh, which, which are a hangover of the previous round of negotiations before we embark on a new one. Now, what actually happened in Doha was that we reached a compromise. And it was agreed that the developing countries have a valid position and many of these issues will have to be discussed and resolved before the next round of negotiation starts. I, I think we are on the right track. After all, you have to reconcile the interests of the industrial countries and the developing countries. Otherwise, you can't have a new agreement. Your views on population mm. control. Well, the, this, this is a very relevant question. Yes, you're right. Um, we are on our, on our way to become the most populous, populous nation in the world. And unfortunately, I say this, um, we don't like the distinction of being the most populous nation in the world. We would rather give it to the Chinese. But, <laughs> but as, as far as our policy goes, we have been in favor of family planning. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's effective in China. Why, aren't, why isn't it effective in India? Uh, you have to understand there's a difference between the social and political structure in China and in India. We are a democracy, and we certainly can't use coercive methods to enforce family planning. But we've had a program of education and uh, promoting the cause of family planning. And you'll be happy to know, for the first time, the population growth has been reduced to 1.8%. And if, it is, if this continues, we will reach a plateau, and then it will be possible to have the population control. It's been a process of uh, trial and error. Uh, we have made slow progress, but we are there. One of the key that we have discovered is education. And we have seen that there is a ratio between population growth and education. We've seen in the Southeast Asian countries that population comes down as the rate of education goes up. We have achieved that. Today, we have achieved 65% uh, literacy. We still have a long way to go. But there is a key within a key, and we have discovered that the secret lies with female education. And we are focusing on female education because if your know, women are 100% literate, I can guarantee the population problem will be a non-problem. <laughs> Would you comment on India's relationship yes. with China? That, that's a very interesting question. Uh, let me start by saying that when we became independent, uh, we, had, we had a very sentimental relationship with China. Because China is a great civilization, a great country, we had historical contacts with China. And Pandit Nehru displayed a friendship towards China. We supported Chinese membership of the United Nations. We supported uh, the seat in the Security Council being restored to China. Unfortunately, I, this sometimes happens to nations. Uh, you, you, are, you are sometimes um, rewarded in the wrong way. And uh, in 1962, the Chinese invaded our territory. And it's, it's left a traumatic uh, experience with our people. But uh, life must go on. And so after a long period of frozen relationship, in 1988, when Rajiv Gandhi was the prime minister, he took a bold step. He said, let us put our border dispute in a box because that's a complicated one. That's the reason why we had a, an armed conflict. Put that aside, and let's discuss that for as long as it takes. But let's make, make progress in the other areas. So we started uh, improving our, our trade relations, exchange of people, cultural relations. So at the moment, uh, we have a, a good relationship going with China. As I mentioned earlier, the Chinese prime minister has just been on a visit to India. Our president went there. Uh, earlier. And so we have a good relationship, but the border issue has not been resolved. And we have some anxieties about what China is doing in terms of arming a lot of countries, and this has an impact on our security. We are particularly concerned about Chinese nuclear and missile cooperation with Pakistan, and uh, this has a direct impact on our security. So we make no, most, no secret about our concerns. We um, do take it up with the Chinese. Hopefully, uh, we will have 
even better relations with China. But uh, that's, that's how it is at the moment. Has the Bush administration policy, uh, funding policies, had any impact upon your program on population control? Well, you'll understand, I don't want to comment on a domestic issue here. Uh, so far as our policies go, uh, we are using our own resources into family planning. And those programs will go on, irrespective of whether we receive any U.S. assistance or not. So we are going ahead with our programs. Would you allow international observers into uh, Kashmir? Um, about international observers, let me tell you, uh, if there's one thing that Indians are proud of, and India as a nation is proud of, is the fact that we are the largest democracy in the world. And we are determined to remain the largest democracy in the world. Mind you, when we became independent, a lot of countries were skeptical whether democracy would survive in a country which has so much of poverty, so much of illiteracy. But we, we defied world opinion. We made democracy stronger, and we made the structures of democracy uh, adapt to our requirements. We conduct elections. Every time we have federal elections, mind you, 600 million people go to the polls to elect a government. 600 million people. Now, um, we don't need any international observers to give us certificates regarding democracy. We are pretty proud of our system. We have an election commission, which is fiercely independent. We have the courts, we have the media. They make sure that elections are free and fair. So if we are able to conduct elections in the whole of India, there is no reason why we can't conduct elections in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, you said there are charges of atrocities committed by, by security forces. The reality in Jammu and Kashmir is that in the last 10 years, it's not the security forces which are committing atrocities, it is the terrorists. It is the terrorists who are coming, armed, trained, infiltrating into our country, and killing innocent people. 60,000 people have been killed all over India. By th and this is a new phenomenon. United States faced it on September 11th. We have faced it for the last 20 years. And these are people who are spreading hatred, fanaticism, and killing innocent people. Our security forces are there because we have an obligation to protect innocent people. And if there are charges of atrocities, yes, there must be. And I think there are charges of atrocity uh, against uh, any country in the world. We are not a perfect society. But we are confident that if there are violations of the law, then there is a machinery to deal with this. We have a Human Rights Commission, which is chaired by a former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India. We have a fiercely independent press, and uh, we, we, we are sensitive to the issue of violations of human rights, and we are determined that as a democracy, we want to keep our record clean, and we'll do everything possible not to have these violations take place. So I'm confident that our, our structures, our institutions are strong enough to meet any allegations of human rights violations. Would you comment on uh, how life goes on in uh, the Chinese-controlled part of Kashmir? Uh, this is one of the grievances we have against the Pakistanis. They ceded a part of Jammu and Kashmir to the Chinese. And uh, the Chinese, of course, uh, maintain that uh, they will remain there until an agreement is reached between India and Pakistan on the future of that territory. But the fact is, it is under illegal Chinese occupation. And I don't have to comment on, on what system the Chinese have. Uh, it's pretty obvious that people living in Chinese-occupied territory don't enjoy the same democratic freedom that the rest of India enjoys. Given uh, the turmoil around India, um, what's your secret for stability? Um, I will answer it in, in one word democracy. The difference is that we, uh, we uh, remained a democracy from the time we became an ind independent nation. Unfortunately, in our neighborhood, the democratic exp uh, experiment has not been very successful. I, I think it's, uh, uh, it's unfair to the people in our neighborhood 
that they do not enjoy the benefits of democracy. Uh, I don't think the people in any of these countries deserve to be under any rule except democracy. But um, what we are trying to do is to uh, spread um, our system by example. Uh, we are hoping that countries around us, and indeed all over the world, will look at the experiment in democracy in India and see how we have succeeded uh, against all odds to maintain our democracy. I can think of that as the only reason why we have maintained it. Let me also mention uh, that we have uh, a very diverse society. Uh, we have eight major religions, and God knows how many countless cults and different religious groups. We speak 18 major languages and nearly 5,000 dialects. Uh, there is a diversity in India, which is incredible. It's much more diverse than, than the whole of Europe, for instance. So how do you maintain this unity, this strong sense of nationalism, and so on? It, it is through democracy that we have sustained this. Because we know that it is through freedom and uh, preserving our multicultural, multi-ethnic heritage uh, through a secular constitution that we can sustain this remarkable experiment. So we are proud of our democracy, and that is the reason why how we have maintained ourselves. Um, let me also mention an interesting fact that um, one of the sources of international terrorism has been uh, the growth of extremism amongst uh, Muslims all over the world. And mind you, it is not, not, uh, not Islam that is responsible for this. It is a perverted interpretation of Islam by which a small minority claims to interpret the holy book and use terror as a method of uh, obtaining its objectives. Now, we have 150 million Muslims in India. We have more Muslims than Pakistan, than Bangladesh. Uh, we have more Muslims than the entire Middle East put together. Now, uh, Tom Friedman wrote a very interesting article in the New York Times more than a month ago. When he went to India, he, was, he wondered why our Muslims are different from the Muslims in the rest of the world. They were not holding demonstrations uh, in favor of Osama bin Laden. They were not burning effigies of President Bush. But the, so his answer was, again, democracy. That this is the largest group of Muslims anywhere in the world who are enjoying the benefits of democracy, which is why they are, they are a part of our great national experiment in democracy. And maybe there's an answer to extremism and terrorism all over the world. Maybe there should be a greater effort to bring in democracy. That's Would right. you uh, give a short statement on <laughs> relations with Russia over the last 20 years? Uh, here, let me take, by, take you back to the Cold War years. And this has been a genuine area of uh, some difference between the United States and India. Now, uh, as, as always, there are always different versions of what is the truth. It's the old story of the half-empty glass. Okay. Now, the view from Washington has been that India has more or less, had more or less joined the Soviet camp. And uh, I mean, we were regarded as some kind of, of communists. Uh, if you go back to the statements of John Foster Dulles, for us, he represents the policy of the United States during the Cold War years. And he had made it very clear that uh, his vision was black and white. And there is no, no possibility of any gray areas between black and white. So we were, we were forced into the Soviet camp, even though we maintained that we were non-aligned. We didn't want to take part in big power politics. We didn't want to belong to either the Eastern camp or the Western camp. So uh, our relations with Russia in the beginning were not particularly cordial because as the United States distrusted us, so did the Russians. Because uh, the Russians uh, weren't very comfortable with Jawaharlal Nehru with his Western education having been uh, to Cambridge. 
and with his Western liberal ideas, they didn't quite trust him. And I recall that one of the Russian papers had called him the running dog of capitalism. Now, uh, so for a few years, this was the position until the Soviets started looking at us differently and started befriending not only India, but the entire developing world. They started helping us with, with economic assistance, with military assistance. Now, remember that in those days after independence, we didn't have any capital, but we, we wanted to set up heavy industries. We wanted huge amounts of capital to set up steel plants and set up industries. The Russians came forward with a scheme by which they gave us uh, a long-term credit, which was repayable in, in rupees, and it helped us to set up our basic industry, our heavy industry. So we are grateful that they helped us when we needed it. In contrast, when we came to the United States, um, the attitude here was that uh, U.S. assistance can't be given to a country which has a large public sector within its economy. That was an ideological viewpoint. And I remember that uh, Professor Galbraith, when he was ambassador in, in New Delhi, was despairing because he wanted America to be involved in the economic uh, growth in India. He wanted the United States to help uh, India set up a steel plant. He didn't find any sympathizers, any supporters, either in Capitol Hill or within the administration here. Now, fortunately, the Cold War is over, and we are now able to look at each other in a more transparent way, not through the prism of the Cold War. And one example of this is something which happened last November. Our prime minister came here on a state visit directly from Moscow. And I remember making a comment in public saying, if this has happened during the Cold War years, the plane would have been sent back to Delhi. But it didn't happen. Because the Americans are comfortable with our having good relations with Russia. The Russians are comfortable with our having good relations with the United States. And this is the, the new global setup, that we are entitled to have our relationship. And so long as it's not the cost of the other, nobody should mind. So at present, uh, the relationship we had with the Soviet Union has now been transferred to Russia. Russia remains a country which has very close and uh, strong links with India. Uh, we are still receiving uh, not much of economic assistance. I think uh, they are themselves in great economic difficulties. But uh, in many areas, we have cooperation which is going on. But I'd like to say this is not at the cost of the United States because what we have seen is an is, is an exponential growth in our bilateral relations in the last few years. Essentially, what is India doing to educate the youth, especially in the areas of, uh, I think, it was referenced back to the birth control question? Female education. Female education in general. Uh, well, Kerala, you, you mentioned Kerala. Yes, Kerala is, is, is the model uh, which we are trying to follow because Kerala has the highest literacy in India and Kerala has the lowest birth rate in India. So there is a definite correlation. What we are doing is we are trying to make uh, education, at least school education, compulsory up to the age of 16. Up to the age of 16, every Indian child, boy or girl, will have the right to free education. And there are efforts to keep on increasing the cap to make it 18 and beyond. So uh, this is the goal of the government. Now. Uh, as you're aware, the, it's not that we don't desire uh, expanding the educational programs. We have a serious constraint of resources. So within those cons constraints, we are able to go ahead with this program for uh, free and compulsory education up to the age of 16. And a lot of emphasis is being given to encouraging the girl child to come to school. You know, the social prejudices, uh, traditionally parents have train their daughters to get married and, and so on. All this is changing because the girls are being sent to schools, sent to college, they are getting into the professions. And the, the happy news is that you go to any school or any university in India, you probably see more than 50% of women in all these institutions. There's a great surge in female education which is going on. And they are getting into all professions. There is not a single area 
where women have not entered. Uh, I dare say, uh, even compared to the United States, we have done better in many areas. We, we, uh, it was uh, um, nearly 10 years ago that the first batch of female fighter pilots came out of the Indian Air Force. Is the caste system alive yes. uh, in India? <clears throat> um, the caste system is dead in the Constitution. But that doesn't mean that the caste system is really dead. Uh, our laws go against the caste system. Our constitution has made it clear that the caste system is illegal. But uh, as in every country, it takes a long time for practice to catch up with the law. And uh, we are going ahead in narrowing that gap. So uh, if anybody talks about caste or practices uh, caste, particularly untouchability, it is a criminal offense, and it's punishable by law. But um, there are remnants, there are pockets, where people still uh, hang on to the prejudices of the caste system. I think education, and uh, as we make economic progress, this is going to be less and less of a problem. Your leadership, is it educated primarily in India or Great Britain or the United States? Or? Yeah. Uh, if you take the, the group of leaders who fought for independence, there was a large percentage of people who had gone abroad for studies, particularly to, to the United Kingdom. That's partly because uh, opportunities for education were limited in India. So you had uh, Jawaharlal Nehru went to school in Britain, but you also had Mahatma Gandhi and uh, a whole lot of other people who went abroad to study law and humanities, science, and so on. <coughs> Uh, if you look at uh, today's leadership, you'd find very few who have gone abroad for studies. And it's also reflected in the civil service. I remember um, the, the groups uh, before me which joined the foreign service used to be sent to Oxford and Cambridge for training. It didn't happen in my time. We've received all our training in India. I think it's far better and better suited to our requirements. How well does your program for the education of women work within your Muslim community? Yeah, uh, very interesting question. Now, uh, traditionally, we have this picture of uh, the Muslim community being backward and not wanting uh, to send their children to, for education and so on. Now, again, I, I go back to the state of Kerala, which has disproved it. Because Kerala has one of the largest Muslim populations, has one of the largest Christian populations. Traditionally, religious groups which are, which are assumed to be against family planning. But Kerala has proved that uh, religion has not can come in the way of either education or family planning. So far as our laws go, there is no discrimination between Muslims and anybody else. Everybody is, is, uh, has, has the same uh, freedom and the same opportunities. So uh, it is no different for the Muslims, no different for anybody else. The question is, is democracy in essence uh, uh, born within your culture as opposed to being a political creation of the recent past? I, I think Dr. Parekh is right. Um, notionally, our democracy is uh, 52 years old. Because uh, if you date it from the time we adopted a constitution, became independent, all right. But we had uh, democracy in practice in many parts of India from ancient times. But what he referred to was something else. It's, it's part of our culture, it's part of our spiritualism. And I'll illustrate by referring you to Hinduism, uh, which is the faith which, which is accepted by the majority of the people of India. Now, it's, it's a, I would say it's a strange religion where um, you might believe in God, he might not believe in God, you might believe in many gods, you could still uh, be members of the Hindu faith. Now, this has given us, given our culture, the, the feeling that you can have differences of viewpoints, but you don't have to kill each other in order to establish it. So we have a very old, ancient uh, saying in Sanskrit that uh, God is one, and the truth is one, but there are many different ways of reaching it. And that basically expresses the inheritance that we have, that our diversity has been accepted as a fact of life. 
And the fact is that we have four great religions which emerged from the soil of India. And in our spiritual quest, we got religions from outside. We got Judaism, we got Christianity, we got Islam, and very interestingly, uh, a, a religious group called Zoroastrianism. Now, these were uh, people who were fire worshippers, and they were practicing their faith before Iran became Islamic. And they came under persecution. And some of them escaped to India in boats. And they set themselves up in, in Western India. And the only reason why this religion has survived, has not become extinct today, is because they enjoyed religious freedom in India. And this, this faith has remained vibrant. The Parsis are, are a feature in our national identity, and they have contributed a lot. So what I'm saying is, this supports what Dr. Parikh says, that we have a spiritual inheritance which enables us to practice democracy, which is that you allow diversity of opinion, and you take a consensus, and you don't allow extremism to take charge. Does American uh, warmth toward Pakistan and support of her complicate your relations in any way? The answer in short is no, uh, because uh, we understand that the United States engaged in a, a war against terrorism. It uh, involved a military operation in Afghanistan, and certainly for a military operation, the facilities that Pakistan could offer uh, were not available anywhere else. So it's quite understandable that the United States has, has uh, given economic assistance to Pakistan. And by the way, Pakistan is sending a bill for the, uh, for, for the services rendered. <laughs> it's it's uh, approximately $2 million a day. Uh, so we, we don't grudge that relationship. Um, that's perfectly understandable. Where it affects our security is when people talk about a, a military uh, supplies relationship. And that takes us to the fears of the Cold War period. Because the, Pakistan became a military ally of the United States. And because of that, Pakistan was given large amounts of American weapons as, as, as a consequence of that. And we know from historical experience that even though these weapons were meant to fight um, communism or, or uh, uh, Russian troops in Afghanistan, the only country they actually used it against was India. So we have told our friends here in the administration that, look, we don't mind you giving economic assistance if Pakistan needs uh, 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 funding for economic stabilization. We fully understand. We, we, it's in our security interest to have an economically stable Pakistan. But you have to draw a line when it comes to military supplies because that will affect our security and then it will complicate our relationship. As of now, I'm reassured there is no such complication. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you.